This is God speaking to me. I am what God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His word, I believe His word, and I live by His word. Christ is my master, and to Him I am in absolute surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated, please. This morning, we will be concluding our uh, study. Uh, we've been doing, I think, the last uh, six, seven Sundays on our spiritual authority as believers and uh, talking about exercising our authority. And as I was preparing for this, I said, you know, maybe I need a few more Sundays <laughs> uh, to finish this. And then I said, oh, no, it's going to be too long. People get bored. Uh, I said, okay, we'll come back. We'll keep some more. For <laughs> probably need another four more Sundays to really uh, complete some of the things I wanted to share. Uh, but we'll cover what we can today. And then we'll come back and revisit this topic and delve a little deeper into this. Uh, but I want us to... Uh, I want to be, we started talking last Sunday about how we exercise our authority, having established the fact that God has given to us authority. Uh, we started talking about how do we exercise our authority. And I want to complete what we started last Sunday. We talked about our seven areas that, uh, we, will, that we are addressing when we're talking about exercising our authority and practice. Do we have the thing up? Have it up. Okay, fine. Um, we, we uh, seven areas. First, we talked about the weapons of our warfare. We said God has given to us spiritual weapons that are mighty through God. All of us can exercise. All of us can use those weapons in our warfare against the enemy. And so we went through those weapons. The name of Jesus, the word of God, the armor of God, the blood of Christ, blood of Jesus, praise, and, uh, and so on. Uh, the other thing that we covered last Sunday was being defensive, exercising our authority to protect and prevent, to put a hedge of protection around you in the spiritual realm. It's like what Job said, I mean, in the book of Job chapter 1, you read about it, where Satan comes and says, you know, there's a hedge around Job, and I can't pass through it. I can't penetrate through it. And that's a spiritual reality, that you can have a hedge of protection around you, and the devil says, can't do any damage to that person, can't harm that person. And uh, interestingly, if you look at Job chapter 1, verses 1 to 10, uh, Job did not have a perfect household. His kids probably are partying every Friday night. So every Saturday morning, Job was making sacrifices, you know, praying to God for his family. And, you know, in case they've done something wrong. And uh, uh, just, you know, so here was this one man who was seeking God, but his entire household was under a hedge of protection. So much so the devil said, I can't pass through it. Amen. So there is this possibility for all of us to have a protective, to put on a protective covering in the realm of the spirit. Because the Bible says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you, is what the Bible says. Amen? So there is this place of immunity, if you will, that is accessible for all believers. Amen? A place of immunity in the presence of God. So for us in the realm of the Spirit, we need to be defensive first. 
And then we talked about being offensive, exercising our authority to attack, using our God-given authority. Uh, and we talked about different things we do, like binding and releasing and casting out. And all of these things we can learn uh, as believers to do in our battle against the enemy. So that's where we stopped last Sunday. I want to cover four more areas and then try to put all this together, wrap it up for us today. And, and, and we'll leave this for a moment. And, and, and uh, uh, as I said last Sunday in, in October, we are going to share with us a strategy for all of us to be involved so that we can take all these truths and begin to see our city reached for Jesus. Amen. That means all of us are going to be involved. So it's not enough coming and hearing, well, I've got spiritual authority. That's good. But you've got to do something with it. And one of the things we want to do is together begin to take our city in the realm of the spirit. And we will be sharing that strategy with you, how we're going to impact the city. Now, number four, the fourth area of, of or fourth way of exercising our authority is through prophetic prayers decrees and actions. Prophetic prayers, decrees and actions. You know, we said in the very beginning of this whole study how the spiritual, uh, the natural and the spiritual are very much interconnected. How things we do in the natural uh, open doors to the spiritual. And, uh, and there are times when individuals Communities, cities, entire nations are affected by the spiritual realm because of things that have taken place in the past. There may be promises that were given to them as a people. There may be sins of the past done by previous generations. And these things of the past could affect an individual, could affect a community, could affect a city, could affect an entire nation. And so part of us exercising our authority is coming into a place where we undo or put a close to the past and release the blessing of God that he intended for every people on this earth. So that's where prophetic praying, where sometimes we, you know, some, some of these things of the past may be understood by looking at history. Some of, it, some of it may be revealed by the Holy Spirit. So you may not necessarily know it through history, by looking at history, but you may know it because the Holy Spirit revealed it to you. And that's why we call it prophetic, because God reveals these things. For example, if you're ministering to a person and, and, and this person is telling you, look, I'm feeling very depressed. I'm feeling very, uh, you know, totally depressed all the time. You may not, may not know this person at all. You may not, may not know the details of this person's life. But the Holy Spirit might prompt you and say maybe there was an abuse in this person's life as a child. And, the, the, and, and, and this person is still carrying the scar of that abuse, which is really the root cause for this depression. How did you know? Through the it's prophetic, the Holy Spirit reveals. Amen? And so that is key in then ministering, using your authority to minister healing and wholeness and deliverance to that person. So prophetic prayers, decrees and actions. We need to pray prayers. Sometimes prayers of repentance. Sometimes prayers that welcome the, the uh, prophetic destiny. Of God over an individual or a community. We need to make prophetic decrees that release blessing and reverse curses. Or we need to do things that bring spiritual change in that individual's life or the life of the people. There are several examples of this. For example, prophetic prayers, uh, which include repentance and confession. 
take for example Nehemiah and also about Daniel. You read about this, this in Nehemiah chapter 1. You read about this in Daniel chapter 9. You know Nehemiah, when he realized what had happened to his, when he knew, heard about the city of Jerusalem that, was, that had been destroyed and was still in a state of destruction, he begins to pray and he confesses sin, not his sin, but he confesses the sins of his whole nation. He's identifying with the wrongdoing of an entire nation. And he says, God forgive us. It wasn't what he did. But he's repenting on behalf of his own people. Same thing with Daniel in Daniel chapter 9. When he realizes the time for the fulfillment of God's promise is upon the people. He repents on behalf of the whole nation. He says, God forgive us. For the wrong we have done as a nation. It's called identific identificational repentance. So sometimes you're praying for an individual. You may not have done the wrong. But the person is done. But you step in as an intercessor. And you say God forgive us for our sins. You're not the one who did the wrong. But you're identifying yourself with the sin of that individual. Or the sin of the people. Or sin of that city. So when we begin to engage spiritually for our city, one of the things we need to do is identify with the sins of the city. You and I may not be drug addicts. You and I may not be drunkards. And you're not, you and I may not be doing the things that are, that's being done in the city. But we identify with the sins of the city. And when you pray, you don't say, God forgive them. You say, God forgive us. Because you're part of the city. Amen. And you're standing and asking God's mercy and forgiveness upon the sins of the people, the individual, the community that you're part of. Even though you're not the one who's doing it. God forgive us as a city. We've gone astray from you. As a city, we've, we're into this and this and this. God forgive us. Amen? So we're going to start doing those things. We'll share with you how we're going to do those things. But that's very important. Um, and uh, sometimes entire communities can be under a curse because of decisions made by the forefathers. Or they could be under a blessing. I mean, think about the Jewish people. God blessed the Jewish people, but the Jewish people brought a curse on themselves. So what do you mean? You remember the time when Jesus was going to be crucified. What did the Jewish elders say? They said, let his blood be upon us and our children. Matthew 27. Matthew 27 verse 25. What the Jewish leaders, they brought a curse on themselves, the entire nation. Let this man's blood be on us and our children. Meaning them and their descendants. God wanted to bless the Jewish nation. But these Jewish leaders at the time of crucifying Christ. Brought a curse on themselves and their entire descendants. Let his blood be on us and our children. So that way you don't, we don't know how communities. Sometimes individuals, individual families, sometimes communities, sometimes cities. Because of some leader in that city, because of some uh, person of prominence and influence in the city, at some point brought a curse on that city. Because of whatever he said or done. Or, but then we stand there and we have to reverse it. We can reverse it. Amen? So that's identifying with the people and that's important to be to be done because someone of influence invited a curse that has to be closed that door has to be closed so that the blessing of God can flow prophetic decrees these this is very powerful when God reveals something to you about a community about an individual about a city about a people and he says speak this Declared this, it's very powerful. In Jeremiah chapter 1, the calling of Jeremiah is so interesting. God says, Jeremiah, come 
I will make you a prophet to the nations. God says, you know, Jeremiah says, Main bacha ladka hon, God. I'm just a little boy. God says, do not say, I am just a boy. Behold, I have put my word in your mouth. And I have said to you over the nations and over the kingdoms, when you, to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to build, and to plant. He says, don't say I'm just a small person. I put my word in your mouth. And when you speak those prophetic words, nations and kingdoms will shake. Amen? See, God's word in your mouth, doesn't matter who you are, you know, in status on the earth. But when you proclaim the word that God puts in your mouth, God says, nations and kingdoms will shake. You will root out, you will pull down, you will destroy, you will build and plant. Amen. That's prophetic decree. So when we are engaging, maybe you are engaging for your community and you are walking by and suddenly the Holy Spirit comes on you and says, speak life over this. Maybe it's a whole group of slum dwelling. And you say, I proclaim life upon all these people living in the slum. So what's going to happen? It's powerful in the spirit. That's exercising our spiritual authority. Uh, 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 the things that are holding that generation and the generations of people in that will be broken because somebody like you proclaimed a prophetic decree breaking the hold of, of those, those powers of darkness that are keeping those people oppressed. Amen. But we need to do it. And each one of us can do it. Each one of us can rise up like Jeremiah. He was giving excuse. God, I'm just a boy. God says, don't make that an excuse. I'm putting my word in your mouth. And when that word goes out, kingdoms and nations will shake. Just speak it. Release that prophetic decree that God's putting in your mouth. Release it. There is prophetic action. So in exercising our authority, another thing we do is prophetic action, meaning somebody in the past may have done something wrong and therefore opened the door to demonic uh, works in their lives, in their home, in their community, in their state, in their nation. Bloodshed, killing, violence, all of those things. Injustice. Now here you come, you say, God, I want to see this individual delivered. But they are under a curse because of something done. They may have done or their ancestors may have done. And how are you going to minister? You need to close that door. And so God may give you a thought. Do a prophetic act. It's in proxy. See, in school we used to do this. We used to give proxy attendance. Yeah. Joe, are you here? Yes, sir. Mary, are you here? Yes, sir. <laughs> Joe and Mary, same person answered. You know, proxy attendant, you know. So in the, so you are doing something similar. Now, standing in proxy for somebody else and on their behalf, doing something to reverse the curse. Maybe they committed injustice towards a certain group of people. And because of that, they are uh, under, you know, they've opened the door under demonic working in their lives. So you stand on their behalf, you, you do an act of restitution, an act of reconciliation on their behalf with the people who, have, who, have, who are on the receiving end of that injustice. You do it on their behalf. Amen? And this is prophetic. You're not just simply go and do it. You know, come on, distribute cakes to everybody. It's not like that. The Holy Spirit reveals to you what you need to do. That's why it's prophetic. Because sometimes you may not even know what was done in the past. But the Lord says, you stand on their behalf and do this. And it's very powerful. Because remember, what we do in the natural opens the door to the realm of the Spirit. So as you stand in proxy and do something, 
the realm of the spirit over that individual group community changes. The greatest proxy, if you will, was the cross of Jesus. He went there on your behalf and mine. And look, we are under a blessing. Amen? So that's what you and I are doing when we do prophetic action. We are standing in behalf of somebody else and making restitution, or reversing a wrong that was done in the past. You're doing the right thing to reverse the wrong thing and you're causing a blessing to come. What happens at that moment? The, the, the hold of the enemy over that generation, that individual stops right there. Just like the cross of Jesus. Amen? Now you can exercise authority to release blessing over that individual, over that city, community, generation. You can do it. But God may lead you, first of all, to pray prophetic prayers where you repent on their behalf. To pr make prophetic decrees where you speak words that changes the spiritual atmosphere over that individual life. Or God may lead you to do a prophetic action that, that reverses the wrongdoing of the past. And then you release the blessing that brings about change. Amen? So, as small as this thing may be, it's very powerful very important in our in the exercise of our authority number five we talk about corporate power where two are better than one very simple and it's true even when it comes to exercising spiritual authority Jesus said in Matthew 16, he said, you know, we, we discussed this already. He said, I, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not have a power over it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven so that you bind on earth what has been declared bound in heaven. And you release on earth what has been released, declared released in heaven. Matthew 18, he puts the same thing under context. He says, if two of you. Agree on earth as touching anything that you ask. It will be done of my Father who is in heaven. And then he continues. He says, for whatsoever you bind on earth, what has been bound in heaven, you lose on earth, what has been loosed in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I. Amen. So in some situations, Especially when we are dealing with rulers of darkness. The spirits of wickedness in heavenly places. Over regions and territories. We do it corporately. But two or more are gathered in his name. He is there. And then in the same context, he says, you bind on earth what has been bound in heaven. And you lose on earth what God has released in heaven. Amen. So there is corporate power. So sometimes when you're trying something on your own, it's not working. Gather together a few believers. Maybe you need little reinforcement. Nothing bad about you. It's just the reality of the spiritual realm. Amen? So don't be ashamed. Oh, how can I call two, three more people? They, well, you know, they think I'm not praying enough. for it. Relax. That's why nations have armies. They don't keep one soldier. You fight all the battle. They have armies to engage the enemy. Amen? So we are an army of God. We side in with each other. We stand as troops. We fight with each other and engage each other in their battles. So don't be afraid to get some reinforcement with you. In case what you're trying, you're not getting a breakthrough, you're not seeing deliverance, you're not seeing um, uh, uh, the end result. Get a few people together and say, let's go after it together. Let's engage in this together. When Jesus sent his disciples out, he didn't send them one by one, he sent them two by two. Amen? Amen? So learn. Let's do it that way. Be an army as we engage together. 
Paul writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 5. He says, when you are gathered together, 1 Corinthians 5, 5. In the name of the Lord Jesus and with the power of the Lord. So what happens when we gather together corporately in the name of the Lord? The power of the Lord is also present. Amen. So in a corporate environment like this, there is great power present for us to do great damage to the enemy. That's why the devil likes to keep believers in church fast asleep. So what did he do in church? I took my Sunday nap. So then we are useless. And we are robbed of the power that we could actually exercise in the realm of the spirit. Because we went to church to take a nap. Amen. But brethren, that will not be so amongst us. Amen. When we come together. We come together in the name of the Lord Jesus with the power of the Lord. And we are here to see things happen in the lives of individuals, in the lives of people, in the life of our city, and in the life of our nation. Because God has vested us with authority and we cannot sit around playing with toys. Amen? We need to grow up and take up our weapons of war. Amen. So there is corporate power and authority that we must learn to exercise. Number six, calling AAA. Those of you from the U.S. will understand that. It's basically getting angels to assist us. Now, sometimes, you know, uh, we can have different kinds of believers, believers who for everything they want an angel and a saint. Or there are others who totally ignore angels. Now, it's not right, of course, to get obsessed with angels and you start worshipping angels. Because many times in the Bible, the angels scold these human beings who start worshipping them. Don't worship me, worship God. But at the same time, it's not right for us to ignore angels. Because Hebrews 1 and verse 14 says that God has sent his angels. Angels are ministering spirits sent to minister to those who are the heirs of salvation. So you and I are heirs of salvation. We have received and we inherit salvation. Angels have been sent to minister for us. To be on our aid. So we must not ignore them. They are there for our advantage. And maybe at some point we'll do a detailed uh, study on angels. But the Bible talks about different kinds of angels. Angels that guard. Guards and angels. Their job is to protect. And many times our lives have been kept safe because they're doing their duty and we never even recognized it. Psalm 34 verse 7 says, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Now I remember this one thing I still can't forget. Um, when I was in college, I used to work out morning and evening. And uh, in the evenings, I used to go for a long jog. And I used to jog to end point. You know the place where I used to go for prayer? The rest of the week, I used to visit it, but for jogging, you know. <laughs> so I used to jog all the way from my hostel room, ah, about three, four kilometers, whatever it was. I remember one day, I was uh, jogging down this road. And usually on that road, because it's, it's end point, like away from the town, everything, there is no traffic except for some guys who come on bikes and stuff like that. So generally, there's no car traffic. And I was just jogging along and, you know, just very casually. I said, okay, I'll make a U-turn now. Continue. And I was about to make a U-turn. There's a car right there coming full speed. And I, I just don't know how I got pushed away. I could have been run over. 
and you would not have had the chance to attend my burial. <laughs> I could have got run over. Because I was just, you know, casually jogging. I said, okay, it's time for a U-turn. and Just continue. No, I, reached kind of the, I, I didn't hear the car, nothing. And I was coming at a high speed and just went back and my car went for me. The only thing I could think of was, God, thank you for your angel. That's all I could think of. You know? And on Bangalore roads, <laughs> you don't know how many times we have been kept safe, all of us, because of angels on duty. There are guardian angels, angels set to protect us both in the natural and in the spiritual realm. There are messenger angels. Matthew 2, you know, just examples here, not necessarily everything, but some examples. The angel of the Lord warns Joseph saying, you need to take the child and move away to Nazareth. Now you need to take the child and then move back. Uh, go into Egypt, now move back to Nazareth. The angel coming and bringing a message on what you need to do. There are messenger angels. Now, uh, there are times when these angels speak and you don't know it's an angel. Because they're not going to appear to you with flapping wings. Hello, I'm Gabriel. <laughs> I got a FedEx package. <laughs> they're not going to come like that. Many times it's just a word that comes to you in the spirit and you pick it up. But in the message, the angel may have come and delivered that to you. And, and, and uh, it might come like in the case of Joseph in a dream. There's an angel appearing and bringing a message. So there are these angels that bring messages to us from God. And Daniel is another example. In Daniel 10 as he was praying and seeking God and saying, God, I want to understand this. What is, the, what is this prophecy all about? An angel is sent to help make, uh, explain the word, the prophecy. There are warring angels. Meaning these are angels that actually fight. They're not like the Sunday school kids with angel wings. These are angels that are violent. Amen? I don't know how big they may be, but they are strong. And they are there to help us. They are there to assist us. There are examples in the Old Testament, 2 Kings 19, 35, 2 Chronicles 30 to 21, where when Israel is up getting ready to go against the enemy, God sends an angel and says, you know, let's give them a day off today. Go to the work. And the angel of God comes in and takes care of the enemy. Now these angels also war in the spirit. Daniel talks about, Daniel 9 and 10 talks about, you know, the Michael, the archangel, he's fighting against the prince of Persia. And then he's fighting against the prince of Greece. So these, these are, they're engaging in spiritual battle, the spiritual realm. There are angels engaging in spiritual warfare. There are other angels, I mean, I just call them very generally assisting angels. Angels who help assist in various things. Angels, in Genesis 24, uh, Abraham calls a servant and gives him an assignment. A very, very difficult assignment. And, but he says, Genesis 24, 7, The angel of my God will go with you and assist you. So why do you say it's a difficult assignment? Because he had to find a man, a, a bride, sorry, a bride. For Isaac. And he says, God's angel will come with you. Amen. So some of you young boys and girls, maybe you've tried Shadi.com and you've tried whatever. Maybe it's time to ask for some angelic assignments. Amen. There are angels that assist us. So there are angels that can assist you in God's assignment for your life. Whatever you're called to do. You say, I'm in business. Well, there are angels to help you in business. You say, I'm, you know, I'm 
in sales. I'm a school teacher. You need lots of angels to keep all the brats quiet in your class. <laughs> I'm serious. Just try getting angels involved in your everyday activity. Try it. See the difference. God, send your angels. So, when we are engaging the enemy, many times I pray, I say, God, release your angels to go do this, 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 this. Take advantage of that. God, release your angels. Or you say, I commission the angels of God to go forth and fulfill this word. Because Psalm 103 says, the angels of God, they hearken to the voice of his word. What do they listen to? Not your cell phone. They listen to the voice of his word. So you release, give voice to his word. Say, angels of God, I commission you to go do this, this, and this. This is what the word says. The word says the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the righteous. So angels of God, I commission you to go forth, cause the wealth of the sinner to come into my hands so that I can use it for the work of God. Use it. So, Pastor, I don't pray like that. Maybe you should start praying like that. <laughs> Make use of the angels God has given to you uh, to be ministering, assisting spirits in the realm of the spirit. It's not going to cost you anything to say that. Just a little faith in your heart and see what happens. Amen. So, so also in the realm of the spirit, when you're ministering, exercising authority, you call for the angels to assist you. You call for the angels to come in and, and, and serve. You know, you, you never know. There are probably angels right here. You just can't see it. I shouldn't say probably. There are angels. Because when you came, I hope you brought the angel with you. No, I think I'm sure your angel came with you. Amen. We just can't see them. But they are there in the realm of the spirit to do things for us. The last thing I want to talk about in this whole uh, exercise of spiritual authority that we must understand uh, is what we call as authority gateways or authority points of power. You know, spiritual authority is linked to governmental authority here on earth. That means people who are in positions of authority in the natural, because of their position, also are able to extend great spiritual authority over those under their influence. And you find that in scripture. For example, the husband. Now, spiritually, in Christ, the husband and the wife are equal. There's no difference. That's why if there is a believing husband, he sanctifies the unbelieving wife. Or if there's a believing wife, she sanctifies the unbelieving husband, spiritually. And yet, in that context, there is a governmental authority where the husband is the head. That's why, and, and, you, and I'm quoting from 1 Corinthians 7, 14, also 1 Corinthians 11, verses 10 and 11. That's why Paul says that for the woman, a husband is a covering because of the angels. He's a covering to protect her in that situation. So the husband has spiritual authority. Is an authority gateway in the home. He extends his protective influence over the entire home. Amen? You look at the local church, Hebrews 13, verse 7, verse 17, talks about those elders who watch over your souls, who give an account of your soul to God. I mean, they have responsibility. With responsibility, there is authority, there is accountability. And so, 
The writer of Hebrews says you submit to them because they have authority over your souls in the realm of the spirit. So the pastor, the spiritual leader, the leaders have authority over people in the congregation. So also government leaders and officials, they are head over the people. In Romans 13, 1 to 4, Paul says they are actually God's ministers. So these are authority gateways. And similarly, in other social structures, as a teacher, you have authority over your class. Most teachers do. <laughs> as a captain, you have authority over your team. As a boss, as a manager, you have authority over your sphere of influence. You are a gateway and entry point because of your position in the natural. Which means that if you're in a position of authority in the natural, governmental authority, you can call it, refer to it that way. You can exercise spiritual authority on behalf of those who are under the realm of your influence. So, as a husband, you can exercise spiritual authority over your home, or your wife, your children. Now, understand, spiritual authority is not dominating their will. It's not like sitting and saying, today my wife will cook chicken curry. <laughs> I'm not talking about that. Spiritual authority is not manipulation. It is not controlling somebody else's will. It is affecting the spiritual atmosphere around them. Amen? So you can do it. So if you feel that your kids are being exposed to spirits of disobedience that are in the world, don't sit down there and say, are you... Pastor, my children, I don't know what is happening. Poor Babu. Till he was in children's church, he was a nice boy. When he came out of children's church, I don't know what happened, Pastor. Listen, you have authority. There is demonic influence in this world. Let's not pretend it's not there. But you, as a parent... Take authority over those influences. Amen. You don't have to sit around helpless. You cover them. Protect your kids. Say, I forbid demonic influences from attacking their mind. Because as long as they are in your home, they are under your authority. And because you are their parent, you can exercise spiritual authority over their lives. Amen? You can. Do it. So, in that context, in different areas of life, some of you sitting here are leaders in your place of work and you have people under you. Exercise spiritual authority to see them prosper, to see them be blessed and see them flow together. Bind spirits of conflict. And you should have a team of miserable people. They always fight. Well, I know part of it could be interpersonal problems, but part of it could also be wrong influence. So take authority in the spirit. Bind those forces of darkness that cause people to behave a certain way and influence people a certain way. But on the flip side, if you're a person in authority, you also must understand that what you do affects those under you. Positive, negative too. Think about it, and I've made mention of this earlier, but in 1 Chronicles 21, verse 1 to 13. Here was David, King David, a man after God's own heart. He loved God. He was a sweet psalmist of Israel. He was a prophet. He was a priest. He was a king. I mean, he had everything going for him. A successful military leader. He had established the kingdom like never before. Uh, and uh, Just a wonderful man. And yet, 1 Chronicles 21 verse 1 says, Satan wanted to do something against Israel. And so he provoked David. To do something David was not supposed to do as a leader. And when David did that, the entire nation, entire nation of Israel began to suffer. Until David said, God, I'm sorry. 
and he repented. So as a leader, what you do affects those under you. And so you've got to take your position, your place of leadership very seriously. Can't play with it. The other side, for those of us who are under authority, here are some things to keep in mind. The strength of our authority is dependent on the degree of submission to the authority above us. So, if you're in your workplace and you want to exercise spiritual authority in your workplace, also make, make sure that you're also properly aligned to the natural leadership that you have in the place of work. Are you with me? You cannot be in rebellion to your natural leader and then try to come in and exercise spiritual authority. Because the degree of influence in the realm of the spirit that you exercise there is in direct connect, directly connected to how well you're aligned in the natural. That's if they're, I mean, you have to be aligned so long as they're not telling you to do the wrong things. You understand? If your boss is telling you to do wrong things, you have every reason to say no. But otherwise, understand that we must be properly aligned in the natural to also be effective in the spiritual. The other important thing for those of us under authority is that we need to pray and undergird those above us. Because understand, those above you, what they do also influences you. So you need to pray for them. Protect them. That's why we say every Sunday morning, we gather together. We want to pray for the leaders of our church. Because it's serious. We understand that leaders face, face those things. And so we undergird them. So that they can walk properly and rightly before God. So that then we in turn can be blessed. Amen. And then keep a watch over those above you to ensure that what's going on with them doesn't filter down to you. Now, I don't want us to get into a paranoia about this. Oh, you know, something's wrong with my pastor. Something's wrong with my boss. That's where it's affecting me. No, 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 don't get, don't get scared. Because you keep your door shut. Amen? You keep your door shut. If those above you are in sin and doing something wrong, you know, don't like get scared and say, no, listen. Just means that you have to be doubly careful that that thing doesn't come down to you. Because there is no perfect leader. There is no perfect boss. There is no perfect manager. So don't feel scared about it. What I am saying is you keep that door shut. You see there's an area of weakness in your leader. You keep that door shut so it doesn't come down to you. So that your leader's weakness doesn't become your weakness. And it's that you undergird your leader. Amen? So, in the realm of the spirit, we keep all of these seven different things I've spoken to us about as we go out to exercise our authority. In closing, I want to just bring all this together and encourage us to exercise authority in all spheres of life. So when I was writing this down, I said, I need one week to talk about how to exercise authority in our personal lives. Another week, family. Another week, ministering to others. Number four, so I need five more weeks. Because each one of these will be a sermon in itself. So we'll come back and talk about it uh, 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 in detail some, some other time. But. Everything you've learned about your authority in Christ, your spiritual authority, exercise it in every sphere of life, beginning with your own personal life. In your own personal life, the enemy will come with intimidation, trying to intimidate you through accusation, telling you you're no good, telling you you cannot do it. Intimidation is a major tactic. Another tactic the enemy will come is with deception. Trying to get you to believe a lie as though it was a truth. Or to disregard the truth as though it was a lie. That's deception. When there's a great call on your life, somebody will come and say, you know, settle for second best. And you believe that. Look, he's deceiving you to rob you of your future and your destiny in God. 
Deception is an attack of the enemy in our personal lives. Temptation, which is an inducement to sin. Oppression, which is a, a wrongful, uh, trying to take away what is rightfully ours. That's oppressor. Or there's obstruction, the enemy will come. Trying to prevent you from fulfilling the work of God. So the enemy comes in your personal life with all these different ways and areas of attack. And you take your authority and you go against it. Amen. Don't sit down there with intimidation. And don't accept that uh, 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 deception from the enemy. Don't sit there and tolerate that temptation and oppression or obstruction. You fight because you're a winner. The Bible says whoever is born of God overcomes the world. You are an overcomer. In our families, raise a hedge of protection as we've been talking about. When you see the enemy beginning to intrude in any area, you resist. You fight, you engage in the realm of the spirit. When ministering to others, Use all these things that we've talked about. And just another thing about families. When your kids go to school and you're afraid about things in school, send the angels with them. Amen? Say, angels, go. With my, but, what is that? Beta on my beta, you know? <laughs> go with my children. Sit with them. Protect them. So make use of these angels. Exercising your authority for your family. When ministering to others, use your authority. And if you fail in one way, try something else. There's nothing wrong. Now I remember now, just last weekend, uh, one of our staff, his wife had fallen ill 45 days ago. Not well. And they went to one hospital. They ran tests. Nothing couldn't find anything. They went to another place, they ran tests, couldn't find anything. Mean, the doctors didn't know, but she was having fever every day. And uh, I think they even went to Chennai, ran tests, couldn't find out what the reason was. And finally, after a long time, uh, uh, they again got admitted in the hospital. Doctors doing all kinds of tests. I remember praying with her on the phone, the beginning of this whole fever episode, but nothing happened. 45 days come and gone, she's still suffering. Last Saturday, that was not yesterday, but the Saturday before, we went to the hospital and uh, this time, we spent some time in the Word first. Right? Shared some very simple things. Like from Psalm 103, He heals us all of all our diseases and He redeems our life from destruction. One of the things that, that she was struggling with was she had reached a point where she said, my life is going to be destroyed. Because maybe some witchcrafts and whatever. So she was in that state. But this word, he redeems our life from destruction. I also felt led to share the story from Matthew 15 about the Canaanite woman who came to Jesus and uh, on behalf of her daughter was troubled by devils. And, 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 and you know, Jesus said, I can't take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. The point is, today we are part of the family, so healing, deliverance is children's bread. Amen? It's on the table. Take and eat it. So for her, just give her the understanding that, you know, what you need is really already served for you. It's on the table. It's children's bread. It's there for you to take and eat. You're not trying to convince God to heal you. He's already served it for you on the table. Healing, every blessing of God is the children's bread. It's on the table. Every child of God is seated on the table. So, share all this and the word brought faith and dislocated wrong thinking. And then we just took a few minutes to pray, very simple, just prayed, did all these things, you know, reversed all curses, reversed any witchcraft. I mean, don't get so spooky spiritual, just pray simple prayers. But do it with authority. Right? So just pray. Now, 45 or so days with fever. Pray that evening. That Saturday night, first night, no fever. Sunday, no fever. 
Monday, doctor said, I need to keep you one more day just to make sure. No fever. Tuesday, sent home. The doctor said, there's only divine healing. Amen. So 45 days, we don't know the cause of the fever. But, now listen. First time we pray on the phone, nothing happens. So don't get discouraged just because you do it one way. That it doesn't happen. Try something else. Use the word of God. Maybe something else. You know, so there are different weapons, different, different ways to exercise authority. You just need to go with it. Don't get discouraged if some one way doesn't work. Amen? So this is authority that God has given to us. Use it when you're ministering to others. And sometimes when you pray for people, you may need to break vows that they have made, curses that they have proclaimed on, the, on themselves, dedication, sins, and trauma, and so on. Exercise authority in organizations, which could include churches, ministries, businesses. Sometimes you need to deal with the spirit that's actually influencing the person. So what do you mean? You say, look, you're going to a deal, you're going to, um, let's say you're a salesperson and you're working for some big MNC, you're going to sell something to somebody, you're trying to close a contract and that person says, you know, I'll sign if you give me X amount of, you know, rupees or dollars as kickback. So what do you do? Take authority over the spirit that's influencing that person. So I've never done it before. Well, try it. Say, I take authority over that spirit that's influencing this man for asking for so and so and so. Or maybe in your work environment, you have somebody who's always hostile to you. Sometimes it's just the way they are, but sometimes it's some, an influence coming through them to, against you. So there's no harm in using your authority to bind any influence that's attached to that person's life that's coming against you through that person. So in my workplace, yeah, don't shout it in their face, do it in the restroom. Or at home before you go to work. You're dealing with the realm of the spirit. Disinfect your workplace. Disinfect your classroom as a teacher. Amen? Listen, we know how to do it in the natural, right? You disinfect the place. So do it in the spiritual. Now, in the natural, we di disinfect regularly. So also disinfect regularly in the spiritual. Because you don't know who is doing what and opening which door. So, disinfect regularly. Your workplace, your classroom, whatever. Your environment that you're going in, disinfect it. So I take authority of every spirit of whatever that you find operating in your work environment, in your organization, whatever. I expel those things. So when do I need to do it again? Do it at whatever frequency you feel, you sense it and thing. Because somebody else may open the door and bring the ugly things in. So you disinfect again. But you're exercising your authority in the realm of the spirit. And lastly, we must learn to exercise authority over regions, communities, cities, nations. And that's what in October we will be bringing to us as a church for us to engage for our city. But let me make this statement, and I want you to receive it in the right sense. In the spiritual realm, the church has been delegated with the highest authority on the earth. Jesus said, all authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore. Why? Because he's is the head, and we are the body. The body walks in the same authority as the head. You didn't get it. The body walks in the same authority as the? He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in? We are his 
body. The body walks in the same authority as the head. So the highest authority on the earth is the church. Let's take it one step further. The highest authority in our nation, the church is more powerful than the government. The church is more powerful than any politician. And the church is more powerful than any political party. I'm not running for government. So please receive this correctly. The point I am making is this. If we want to see change in our city, in our nation, we the church are the only ones who have the ability to bring about that change. Why? Because we in the spirit realm are more powerful than any government, than any politician or than any political party. Amen. So it's time that we as a church arose up in the spirit. Now, there is a natural side of it. I'll make mention of it. But number one, in the spirit to see change in our city and in our nation. If the body of Christ rises up, and takes this seriously and begins to engage in the spirit. Governments will tremble. Politicians will be attending church. Cleaning up the act. The reason our nation is in the state it is. Is because the church has not yet risen up. To do what it's supposed to do. So first, we as the body of Christ must rise up in the spirit for our city, for our nation. And second, in the natural, we need to be salt and light. You know, we are in a generation, in a day and a time when there should be no poverty in our world. There should be no illiteracy. There should be no hunger. You know, 10 years, 10, 12 years ago, when we moved back into India, I made a decision. When we do ministry in India, we will not receive any foreign support. Why? Because I believe there is enough wealth in our nation to fund the work of the gospel. It's a lie of the devil that makes people dependent on money from the West. Till today as a church, almost 100% of all the money we use to do ministry is right from here. We don't need, we don't ask and we don't receive any money from outside India. Now some good Christians, they get transferred, they go on their job outside India. They want to send their tithes or they send it and they get, I mean that's up to them. But we are not dependent on it. So right from day one, we said. There is enough wealth in our nation to fund the work of the gospel. And look what we as a church are able to do. And we're not getting one penny from outside anywhere. So what am I saying? There is no excuse for poverty. There is no excuse for hunger. There is no excuse for illiteracy anywhere in this world starting with our city. And we as a church must rise up Sounds like a political speech. Right? <laughs> but listen, we need to do something. Right? I'm not running for any election, no interest, please. <laughs> but we as a church must arise up in the spirit, begin to change things. And then second, in the natural, do something. Go out, feed the hungry, go out. Uh, fight injustice where you are. Go out, start some Christian schools providing education. Do something to solve the problem. Face corruption with integrity. Amen? But the real battle is in the spiritual. And the point is this. The church is the most powerful force in this nation. 
More powerful than any government. More powerful than any political leader. More powerful than any political party. It's time. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Come on, let's sing. We're going to sing. We have a vision for this nation. Now, some of you may not know this song, but it's our theme song. It's the theme song of all people's church, so you might as well learn it sometime. The very first song we sang when we started the church was we have a vision. We need to keep singing it again. We'll sing it again. That we as a people of God are here. The sea chains in our city, in our nation, and in the nations of this world. God has given us authority. And we have a vision. We know we can fulfill it. I want you to sing with all you've got and then Let's see what happens after that. This nation, we share a dream for this land. We join the angels in celebration. By faith, we speak revival to this land. And every knee shall bow, worship you. Return, confess, you are Lord. Give us an open heaven, anoint our prayers this day, and move your sovereign hand across this nation. For this nation, we share it. This land, we join with angels, celebration, by faith we speak, by will do this land, where every knee shall bow, worship you, every tongue confess, you are Lord. us an open heaven, anoint our prayers this day, and move your soul and cross this nation. Every knee, every knee shall bow, worship you. Every tongue confess, you are Lord. Give us an open heaven, 
point our prayers to stay and move your soul and cross this nation. Amen. Hallelujah. The Lord, move your sovereign heart across this nation. Lord, let the church arise. Let the body of Christ arise. Let the people of God arise in our city and in our nation. Oh God, that we will arise with the authority that's been vested in us to destroy the works of darkness, to destroy the works of the devil. We thank you, O oh God. Let's say this together. I'm a believer. I'm a believer. I'm part of the body of Christ. Part of the body of Christ. The body has the same authority as the head. As the head. I come with all authority, all authority in heaven and on earth flowing through me. Yes, Lord. I come in the name of Jesus. Every devil of hell. Every devil of hell. You are subject to me. You are subject to me. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Demons of sickness. sickness. Of poverty. Of poverty. Demons of depression. Demons of depression. Of oppression. Or oppression. You are subject to me. You are subject to me. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. I come against you. As a, as a servant of God, as a child of God, I go forth to destroy the works of the devil in my life. Jesus rules. Jesus reigns. Satan has no place in me. He has no access to me. In my home, Jesus rules. Jesus reigns. Satan has no access. In my home, in my family, in my place of work, I come in the name of Jesus. I bring the glory of God to my place of work. Darkness is invaded by light. The kingdom of God comes. Righteousness, peace and joy is established in my place of work. In this city, we declare Jesus Christ is Lord. Every knee bows. Every tongue acknowledges in this city, in the city that Jesus Christ, is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord we declare war, we declare war. against demons of fornication, fornication. of alcohol, alcohol. Drug, addiction, drug addiction child trafficking poverty, poverty. Prostitution. prostitution we declare you have no place in this city. Jesus Christ is Lord. We are taking this city for Jesus Christ. We speak to the government. Righteousness be established. Every corrupt government you will fall. Righteousness be established in our city. In the name of Jesus. We speak over our nation. We declare that India is washed in the blood of Jesus. Every village, every town, every city in our nation is washed in the blood. India belongs to Jesus. We declare every knee bows, every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord over India. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.
Jesus' name. Lord, we give you thanks. We give you praise, Lord. We praise you, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. We ask for a mighty ingathering of souls in our nation. We pray that thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people in our city and in our nation will be gathered into the kingdom of Almighty God. In the name of Jesus. We thank you, O God. We honor you. We praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Before we close, we're just going to pray for our personal needs. If there's anyone here, you've never given your heart to Jesus. I want to give you an invitation to receive Jesus into your heart. But here, with any kind of sickness and pain, I'm just going to pray from here. And I want to believe God that there will be healing in your body. If you'll just extend your faith with me. If that Canaan, Canaanite woman could come to Jesus and receive and eat the children. She said just one crumb from the master's table is enough. Just one crumb... From the table is enough. You are a child of God. Healing is your children. Is the children's bread. You can receive every blessing. Let's just pray together. View close. Father, in Jesus' name, I release healing. I command healing to every sick body. In the name of Jesus, I command joints to be healed, joint pain to go. I command tendons, ligaments to receive healing. In the name of Jesus. If you've got pain in your knee, I just want you to believe God. Receive your healing now in Jesus' name. I command healing even for backs. I command word of brace to align up, to discs, to damage discs, to be recreated. I command tendons, ligaments to come in place, nerve endings to come in place. That you'll be free completely from your back pain. I come against every demon of affliction, every demon of infirmity. In the name of Jesus, come out. Release God's people and be healed in the name of Jesus. Now, by faith, receive. I receive. I receive my healing. My wholeness in my body. Lord, we thank you. We praise you, God. If you'd like to receive Jesus, just pray this prayer with me. If you've never done this before, would you please pray and say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive my sins. I believe that you died for me on the cross, that you rose up again. Be the Lord and master of my life from this day forward. And I will follow you the rest of my life in Jesus' name. Amen. Does anyone here you prayed this prayer for the very first time? I'd like you to make your way forward to please meet with Pastor Stephen Benny right after the service. He's right here. He'll give you a copy of the New Testament and share a few instructions with you. So if you've done that today, your very first time, please make your way here. Let's close. Arise and shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Though darkness cover the earth and deep darkness the people, yet the Lord shall arise upon you and his glory will be seen upon you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Go have a great week. Amen.